Good morning. Welcome to the discussion the Green Transition and Bulgaria Opportunities, Benefits and Cost Solutions. Does Bulgaria need new nuclear power facilities? This would be the topic that we're going to be discussing this morning. My name is Gennady Kundarev. I am the senior uh, associate in uh, D3G. Before I uh, welcome our hosts uh, today, I'm just going to um, say a few housekeeping words on the use of our channels online and what we uh, have here in the room. The coffee is available to everybody who's joining us online the whole time until uh, lunch. So we're not going to have a strict coffee break, so to speak, between the different speakers, but you can just take coffee for yourselves. We're going to have a very, uh, you know, very, very long and uh, arduous but productive talk. And so feel free to refresh yourself with coffee and water. Um, as we go along. For everybody who's joining us online, we have uh, English language interpreting. So if you need to uh, hear, please uh, switch uh, between the interpreting channels on Zoom. With the this, I am now going to pass the floor to Radustina Swaf from uh, uh, Zazemianta and uh, Mr. Tolofudorov as uh, hosts uh, uh, who are going to share with us what provoked today's discussion, why is it necessary, and how we're going to proceed. Greetings. Lately, uh, this um, there are actions, very aggressive actions by the government, by the parliament on a new nuclear uh, power plant in Kosovo, Kosovo uh, Unit 7. And what happened was there was uh, um, a very serious uh, breach of the laws enforced with these uh, rapid decisions, um, which are not based on feasibility studies, on public discussions, even on economical uh, analysis, uh, should there be a new unit uh, nuclear power and why? And so we have a, a lot of uh, violations that kept accumulating. We reacted, we sent a letter to the relevant institutions, to the Ministry of Energy, to the Prime Minister, to the Parliamentary Commission on Energy, and also to the U.S. Embassy. Neither of those institutions responded to our communication, and because we don't have a response to the communication uh, wherein we describe the violations of the law and the ordinances and the decision making, so we're basically disputing the decision making itself, the decision making process. Uh, we decided to have this discussion, which uh, will be broadcasted. It will be broadcasted to our colleagues in Europe. The European Commission is invited as well. Furthermore, uh, we were additionally um, annoyed by uh, really aggravating the situation. Uh, Professor Kashiev's uh, firing from uh, Kozlodui or uh, NPP, he was talking about the illegal decision making of the parliament and the approach that they took, which in his opinion was uh, illegal. And so I think this showcases that there should be some public pushback because what is something that politicians do not understand is that the Benin and nuclear power plant project is not failed uh, as a corruption practice. <laughs> Basically, it was a corruption practice, but um, it wasn't failed because the reactor was a Russian. It was failed because um, it, there was no need for it. And, there was no feasibility need for this. And so the political push uh, and so on happened as it happened. And now we're going towards Berene part two. And it's not about us being against nuclear energy or anyone being against it, but uh, having evidence and proof that in 10 or 15 years, um, we're going to need this uh, nuclear power. So it's not a religious issue uh, saying, uh, you know, the nuclear lobby saying we're against nuclear power. Uh, this is not the case here. And also, it's very interesting that the politicians who couldn't uh, agree with one another, they uh, pushed uh, the country to snap elections again. They were very uniform, though they didn't have any divisions when they had to vote for a nuclear power plant. 
uh, Unit 7. And everyone uh, who voted wanted nuclear power. Uh, the ones who were against this project wanted better than the other ones wanted uh, Unit 7. And so, but really, we needed to showcase and didn't get it. Uh, the needs for nuclear power, new nuclear power. And so these are the issues that provoked us in having this discussion. Thank you for coming. Thank you to the people who registered online on Zoom. Uh, thank you to uh, Zazemiata for the organization of this event, because what we're seeing it's not just in Europe, in Central and Eastern Europe. The idea is about having new nuclear power, which are not uh, economically justified and not feasible uh, to have this project developed. Uh, there's a lot of question marks, and it happens uh, in a very large scale. They're planning a few blocks, a few uh, like new units, uh, relying predominantly on, on nuclear power. And so today we have, uh, as our panelists, uh, some very, very serious names, uh, I have to say, in uh, Bulgaria uh, on the topic of nuclear energy. First of all, Professor Georgi Kaschir, uh, who, whose name was already mentioned by Mr. Todorov, who is a former chair of the Committee on uh, Peaceful Use of Nuclear Energy. He has studied, uh, he has taught on the topic of nuclear energy in Vienna uh, University, and he was also the scientific uh, lead on the commissioning of Unit 5 of uh, NPP because we'll do uh, uh, Alexander Kashomov who will present to us uh, everything related to the transparency and legality of uh, nuclear uh, projects in Bulgaria in the last 20 years. Uh, and Professor Dr. Engineer Dimos Kuyo, who will be in his role as a lead of the uh, research group on strategic planning on, uh, the, uh, on the national uh, energy uh, market. Uh, uh, he will be discussing the concept of strategic planning of the national energy uh, structure and uh, reviewing the uh, nuclear power for the structure. And then in the end, uh, we're going to hear from uh, Mr. Vodimirov. Uh, he's a director of the climate program in the Center for Study of Democracy. He will talk about the topic of uh, good governance, but uh, he will present this to us through the... Uh, um, a prism of the uh, uh, invaded uh, state and the invaded nuclear energy, which is a good uh, a prerequisite for corruption practices. So without any further ado, I'll be giving the floor to Professor Kostchev. Good morning, thank you. Let me start with the presentation. All right, I hope you can hear me. Actually, let's, uh, let's just move on to that slide. Okay, uh, greetings. Uh, I'm just going to give you a few uh, words about this project, uh, Unit 7 and 8 of uh, NPP Kozlodi, which I uh, call basically a horrible project because it started horribly and is developing horribly. Uh, in 2012, the Council of Ministers uh, decided on uh, suspending the construction of the NPP Berene. One of the uh, points was that it assigns to the Minister of uh, Energy to uh, make a feasibility status and to file a proposal for development of a new nuclear power on at the site of, uh, of NPP because we'll do it. And then a month later, uh, in April, a decision was taken, which was uh, um, basically called and referred to as the decision uh, in principle to build the uh, Unit 7. A company was uh, hired, uh, the, uh, you know, all the feasibility studies were done, the um, uh, site was approved, and there was the uh, environmental impact uh, assessment study done. And so quite unexpectedly in January last year, the parliament, without any public rounds of discussion, without uh, anything, just all of a sudden decided that we need to build this unit seven of uh, uh, NPP because we'll be using the AP1000 uh, technology of uh, Western House uh, and the uh, agreements uh, were set in motion and the Ministry of Energy would undertake, would be authorized to undertake any and all actions whatsoever 
that it needs to, under Article 45 of the Law on the Safe Use of Nuclear Power, and I would like to mention here that the law on the safe use of nuclear energy is the only law in this area which formulates the safety requirements, by the way, including the ones in Article 45. Uh, it uh, formulates the safety requirements that need to be met when building new nuclear facilities. And so from that point on, what happened? Well, what happened was that, um, and let me just delve here a little bit into the text of the law. The law says the Council of Ministers is authorized to take a decision to build new nuclear power. However, this decision cannot be taken lightly. Just, you know, just decided that the Ministry of Energy actually needs to fulfill a series of uh, analysis and all safety aspects and social. Uh, economical uh, aspects of this um, energy project, uh, uh, spent fuel uh, processing method, and so on. The minister has to and must organize all of these analysis and evaluations, make them publicly available for a public count of discussion at least for one month. Uh, they should be available to the public to prepare and then, then be around the public discussion. The law is very, very clear on this part. It's clear what, it's clear what the practice is and the application on uh, NPP Belene, as you saw in 2004, um, the government did take a decision uh, which was uh, basically a makeshift decision. Anyway, let's, but it's considered that the decision was uh, validly made and the analysis uh, were, were done and then in 2004, in the 10th of uh, January, in the National Palace of Culture, there was a public council discussion. In the month afterwards, uh, or four months afterwards, the Council of Ministers took the decision to build uh, NPP Belen. So the law is very, very clear. The practice was also very, very clear on how this was applied. And these things were explained to our partners in the European Union because. The directors in this area have the obligations of drafting periodical or regular reports on um, fulfilling these directives, nuclear safety, spent fuel processing, and so on and so on. And these reports clearly indicate how the minister should file this in this, in this report, how they should uh, contain the evaluations and assessments, and there should be uh, they available to the public to... Uh, become familiar with it, and then a round of discussions. And if you look at uh, NPP, Kosovo, the uh, new powers uh, statutes, uh, basically, it stipulates the same procedure. So on October 25th, 2023, without any advance notice, the Council of Ministers put together um, you know, a meeting, said item 26, uh, report for approval of the report of the Minister of Energy for undertaking actions to build Block 7 and 8 of uh, NPP Kosovo. There were no analysis published, they were not presented, no public discussion rounds were had, have been had, and um, this is a gross negligence of the legal requirements, and it is a gross negligence by the respective members of the directives, which require that the public is notified and the public is involved in the decision making. And so there is no protest, uh, not, nobody said anything, and the decision was adopted. And in my opinion, because this is a uh, gross breach of uh, duty. Uh, this was appealed, and there is there is already a lawsuit in the Supreme Administrative Court to cancel or sorry to repeal this decision. What were the arguments that were uh, mentioned? These are not good arguments. So first of all, the Prime Minister said they will substitute blocks one through four. We stopped them decommissioned them 20 years ago. So everything is already 
you know, it's uh, substituted by other energy uh, facilities. And, uh, and then AP1000 can quickly change uh, and cycle through its uh, power output. And each and every uh, nuclear power reactor can cycle up, up cycle or down cycle and produce more or less, generate more or less energy. And so it provided in some uh, opportunity to work together with renewable energy sources, which is absolutely incorrect and not true because this results in some adverse uh, effects. So for example, if the reactor at night uh, down cycles um, by 50%, the cost of the power would rise by 30%. So if we have 140 euro per megawatt hour, it would become 170 and it, this would become absolutely unscalable and feasible. And uh, European, uh, a member of the European Parliament said, well, in these geopolitical conditions, the most important thing is the security of the European economic area, even though it may be more difficult. And, uh, we saw that uh, Zaporizhia, for example, is, uh, the Zaporizhia example was basically, it, it's not destroyed, but it stopped uh, uh, existing. And we uh, also the new Kakhovka Dam was uh, uh, destroyed and there is no, there is not going to be uh, you know, a power uh, generation facility in uh, Kokka after the destruction of the dam anytime soon or ever. Um, and uh, really, we should not uh, neglect uh, these uh, matters. Uh, so, uh, basically, by the way, the uh, nuclear power plant, if we destroy a dam, uh, cooling water, then the nuclear power plant would no longer be able to operate. And so uh, some members of parliament said it's important for us to be first in Europe, to be pioneers in Europe in developing the AP-1000. The Bulgarian uh, industry will produce equipment and we're going to you know, export uh, uh, electric power to Greece. Um, and Minister Radev said the purpose is to make the uh, project irreversible. What does, it, what does it mean irreversible? We should not be looking to sign an agreement that we cannot uh, revoke. We are going to have to finish it, even though uh, it would be onerous for us. The conditions, if we decide to cancel, would be much more onerous. And that's the, you know, the the fault in the thinking of the minister. Um, and so uh, we can see here AP1000 uh, uh, heating power 3,400 megawatt ton. Um, the net power is between 1,117 and 1,115 megawatts. Uh, and so the main thing here is that the cooling after failure is only done by using passive safety systems, using, using natural principles such as gravity condensation, evaporation, and so on. There are no pumps and, and so on. This is not, I'm not uh, so impressed by this because look, um, in the mid 1990s, uh, these uh, reactors were developed by Westinghouse, these were developed by Russia, AP 600, uh, and so on. There was a consensus that using passive systems, uh, you can uh, recover the uh, basically. Uh, drain the heat, the residual heat, or dissipate the residual heat without, uh, after a potential catastrophe or emergency. Westinghouse went on, it created this reactor, but neither of the two other producers of equipment uh, went this way, which is uh, very dignified. Uh, they think that the combination of active and passive systems is more reliable than just passive. So four reactors were built using this model in China in the period between 2009 and 2018, uh, average uh, construction time, nine years. In the United States of America, a summer uh, project in South Carolina, 2017, after nine billion United States dollars, it was abandoned. The other project that was uh, initiated in uh, NPP Bohu in Georgia started uh, 2013. Average commissioning time more than 10 years instead of the promised lower or shorter than five years. So 
So the instead, so instead of yeah, instead of a little less than five years, it's actually been ten years and four months. Uh, startup costs uh, instead of the fourteen billion USD went completely over budget and thirty five billion USD. And the price of electric power is assessed as 170, 180 United States dollars per megawatt hour, which is just unfeasible here. And so it's basically one of the most expensive reactors in the history of nuclear power, 14,000 United States dollars per installed uh, kilowatt. So it's uh, clear that in uh, North America, this project is seen as a financial catastrophe. And because of this, nobody wants to build it there. Even though there are three companies that have uh, paid millions and millions to get a permission uh, permit by the nuclear regulator to start building those reactors. And uh, another thing is that um, there is, for example, in the UK, which is licensed, uh, uh, even though it's licensed, they don't want to build it in Turkey and the Czech Republic also. Uh, the Czech Republic rejected it in the course of the tender procedure that they conducted. So this graphics here shows how the assessment time was moving and building the two blocks in, in Volvo. Uh, over time, and it was supposed to be less than five years uh, and the end result is longer than 10. One of the main questions uh, here on discussing the nuclear power is what are we going to do with the spent fuel? What are we going to do in 10, 15, 20, 30 years? What are we going to do in the next thousands of years? This graphic shows the radiotoxicity of uh, spent fuel. It starts after 100 years. So up to 100 years, it's clear. You can, um, how should I put it? You can, you can, you know, think of something. But you see here, the red curve, this is the, activity of the so-called minor actinids, uh, amerisi, and so on, uh, which drops to certain uh, tolerable values, uh, uranium ore, if they are buried though, because you know that uranium ore is, um, these are very old uh, ore, bodies of ore, 10,000 10, years later. Uh, if they are buried without destruction, then it goes to 100,000 uh, years of uh, decay. And so our strategy so far was always to process the fuel. And at some point later, we are going to bury the fuel. But uh, for this purpose, it had to be uh, delivered, uh, shipped. Uh, and of course, the uh, program was... Uh, Sabotage in 2015, then two years, uh, then the first Ukraine invasion started, and then it you know, really um, made things impossible. So instead of decreasing, the mass of spent fuel is actually increasing over time. And now this year, it's about 1,000 tons of heavy metals in spent fuel. And so we have a penal procedure uh, enforced upon us by the European Commission. There are no actions whatsoever on uh, uh, building a uh, deep uh, level geological repository of uh, spent fuel. There are no feasibility studies or plans to do it. And if we uh, make new uh, fuel reactors, it would only make the situation worse. In this project, we have a, a repeat uh, of the situation with Belen. So first of all, it was 12 billion euro, and then the red line was 14 billion uh, United States dollars. Uh, but these are just uh, plans, and the facts are in uh, NPP Vogel was uh, 35 billion dollars. And uh, this assessment by the biggest investment bank in the world globally Lazard uh, says that the investment in the United States were for 81,000 would be ranging between 10.5 and 17.5 billion United States uh, dollars. And the factor that the entity bubble was, yeah, uh, much more than that. And the French Court of Accounts is of evaluated in 20, 2020 for a 1,650 1, megawatts in Flamanville, 21 billion United States dollars. 
Uh, and the philosophy was basically for Berenu, we needed an uh, outside investor, strategic investor, that it's very important to have an experienced company and so on and so forth. And now they're saying everything should be done by the state. And it's clear that the state cannot control um, such a big project. And uh, we now have some huge um, financing uh, plans. But how it's going to happen actually is, uh, I mean, they're saying we have a bank. You know, and the two biggest banks in Europe at a press conference said that they're not at all interested in funding nuclear projects as they have previously not been um, interested in. And um, we have something that Minister Radev said, uh, up to 127 Bulgarian level per megawatt uh, hours uh, uh, is what the minister stated, which is not based on facts because the projections in the United States um, and the actual figures the fact in uh, NPP Volo would be 170, 180 USD per megawatt hour, and there are other uh, estimates that uh, 141 to 221. Does anyone know how um, how much does one megawatt hour cost on the ex energy exchange? It's less than 70 USD. So uh, these two huge reactors with uh, huge powers uh, can find. Um, uh, you know, can, can 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 be part of the energy system and how they can be part of the energy system. We can see that um, the decline below 3,600 megawatts and in the summer between 2,500 megawatts, a total power of 2,000 megawatts, nothing is going to work. If uh, uh, nothing else uh, works, then one of these reactors would have to cycle down. The constant cycle down uh, basically increases the cost of energy and it, it uh, reduces the uh, it spends more fuel for the reactor. And so the latest decision of the parliament of Bulgaria at the end of the year is uh, okay, block seven should be commissioned around 2035. Why? Why at this time? Uh, the Council of Ministers adopted that the decision would be to launch in 2033. And, but then the parliament is, you know, a lot of smart guys, so they say 2035. And there is a, a basically disposal with the funds of the state-owned companies, state enterprises, uh, revenue from the sale of equipment for new NPP, Berene would be uh, for this project only. And so members of parliament are saying that they can... Uh, basically uh, dispose of uh, money however they like. And this is, uh, uh, you know, fair competition. There is a clear, inadmissible um, uh, intervention in the work of the nuclear regulator. The, um, uh, members of parliament are saying, I give it 20 months to license this project. But who are you and why are you doing this? And why are you, uh, you know, um, meddling in this um, because just let me tell you how much it required the licensing of this project. The first version took four years. Uh, how much time it took to have the licensing in the UK? 10 years um, or seven years, sorry. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, it's a huge task. And uh, there was an intergovernmental agreement uh, for uh, Bulgaria uh, in the cooperation in nuclear energy. I think this is uh, um, on our end. It's, I mean, they're saying that the uh, United States of America is the leader of nuclear technologies and so on. But I am sorry, but the United States of America were a leader in this area 40 or 50 years ago. Other countries are the leaders now. And um, I mean, 57 reactors are being built, none in the United States. And uh, how many, uh, you know, reactors were built since the start of the century in the United States? Three uh, in China, 52 in Southern and South Korea, seven for outside of the country. So the leaders are China, Russia, South Korea, France, and not the United States of America. There is a really scandalous article of the public procurement law. So the ones who uh, signed it, agreed that Bulgaria will receive uh, or will try to receive an exception or a, a permission by the European Commission 
to uh, not uh, uh, follow market procedures to select a uh, you know a company that does the construction and the contractors and so on. So in my opinion, this is really truly a scandalous thing. I think this is lacking on our side. And now, in conclusion, we uh, need to uh, the work needs to be done by the uh, National Assembly first. It needs to take away the powers uh, and uh, stop this corrupt symbiosis between the executive uh, part of branch of the government and other factors, uh, because each ruling of the Council of Ministers is confirmed by the National Assembly, which dilutes responsibility and no one uh, assumes responsibility for anything. So, unfortunately, in my opinion, this uh, project is truly uh, grotesque. The main question is, do we need new nuclear capacity? I think we may need replacement capacities for units five and six, which uh, will happen a long time ago. Thanks so much to Professor Lukas Chief. Uh, it was a very uh, easy to follow a review of the situation. Just let me add something and then we will get uh, questions and answers. Bulgaria, if we're talking about replacement uh, capacities, uh, Bulgaria has promised to um, transition out of coal uh, no later than 2030 in the new plan for climate and energy coal. Uh, basically disappears between 2030-2035 and in the uh, distribution network development plan, uh, then coal is zero by 2030. Now uh, we can have some questions and answers and comments if uh, anyone in the uh, room wants to participate. We will also be accepting questions online. Do we have questions? Hello, I am Maglena Andonova from Greenpeace Bulgaria. If it's not too uh, technically complicated, can you tell us a bit more about this increase of the value of energy when uh, the unit works at a lower capacity? Is this related to a higher usage of some resources or uh, if you, you can tell us a bit more? So if the unit works at lower capacity, all expenses remain the same, all of them. For example, 20, 24, 26 years, the first years of uh, exploitation, the most important to, uh, part is the capital expenses that are over 70% of uh, the cost. So if you're producing less, your uh, costs will be the same. So uh, this is why the and result is higher. Uh, this is why I'm saying that, for example, if we reduce uh, power to a level of about 80%, then uh, the parameters can still be optimized. If it works for eight hours during the night, uh, the unit, uh, the, co value will, the cost will increase by about 8%. But if uh, the unit needs to go down to 50% capacity at night, then the uh, steam turbine cannot uh, work optimally. There we have a lot more thermal loss. And in such a scenario, if it works for eight hours at night, the cost will increase by 20% of the end cost. This is in terms of the financial side of things. Now, in terms of uh, reactor safety, it's also not recommended to constantly have a lower uh, power because the reactor uh, develops some transitional processes, especially in uh, uh, higher power variations. This causes some uh, stress on the system uh, when uh, the temperature changes rapidly by a few degrees. This can cause strain on uh, the walls. So this is why it's not recommended. Also the equipment in, uh, uh, when you have uh, huge power varieties, this is just not good. And it's proven by the experience of France where they use their nuclear uh, reactors to regulate their energy system. This is why I am uh, profoundly skeptical and uh, 
I don't think the units can work in a good uh, system with uh, uh, hydroelectric plants. No, they need to work at 100% capacity. This is where it's the safest to Thank you, Georgi Stefanov from the Bulgarian uh, Nuclear and Thermal Energy Association. Uh, how long do you think uh, units five and six can continue running? And uh, how much it will cost? And how long can it uh, last? Do you know? According to the current analysis uh, for assessment of the remaining resources of the main equipment, and we uh, uh, they can work for about 60 years uh, a total uh, until uh, uh, about 2051 2050 but this can change uh, because everything depends on the subsequent analysis uh, these analyses are, are typically done uh, once per 10 years so things may change uh, currently, our plans are for uh, work until 2047 to 2051. Thank you so much. Now we uh, give the floor to our next panelist, uh, uh, Attorney Alexander Kashunov, who's from uh, UKF 20 minutes. Uh, thank you so much to the organizers and dear colleagues. As Professor Kachiev said, Currently, we have a new uh, court case filed in relation to this uh, to the decision by the Council of Ministers to build new reactors, uh, units seven and eight of uh, the Kozlodui MPP. To answer the question, what is actually going on? I think we need to talk a little bit about what happened in the past, because in Bulgaria and many other places uh, globally, I think people were forgetting history. And history is important because it sets the context. Uh, by the way, what is uh, happening currently, thanks to the lovely uh, work of the organizers of this event, it should have been done by the Minister of Energy because Article 45 of the Safe Use of Nuclear Energy Act says so. We should have had a discussion based on these three analyses uh, uh, by the nuclear safety analysis, which includes the technology, the social and economic impact analysis, and uh, the matters related to spent nuclear fuel and nuclear waste. These three components, uh, as Professor Kirchhoff and uh, other experts said, they are interrelated because you cannot solve one of these issues like the technology or the nuclear waste or, or what happens uh, with uh, spent nuclear fuel. Uh, you can't solve this in isolation because this affects the cost. Are we uh, making money or are we losing money from it uh, as a society at large? So they're all related. And to replace these uh, uh, lacking efforts by the minister and by the government, let us start by saying we live in a society based on uh, a new tenet, in my opinion, that comes from the round table in uh, 1990, the constitution of 1991. We uh, resolved to change our society and uh, state power uh, had to be transparent and friendly to the citizens and citizens needed access to information and they have the right to be informed not to be lied to as uh, happened uh, uh, in the horrible accident at the chernobyl npp secondly uh, citizens of a democratic society have the right to social participation when important solutions and decisions are being uh, made and thirdly the rule of law and protection of fundamental rights. These are the three pillars of uh, the Aarhus Convention, as you know as well. Uh, for this new principle of society, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant accident, uh, it had a great impact there. And we had uh, a criminal conviction, which was uh, very rare for uh, communist countries, a criminal convention, a conviction for lying to the citizens. It uh, became 
it was enacted because so many people died from various uh, diseases, uh, cancer and so forth as a result of this uh, accident. Of course, we also have the more recent example of the Fukushima MPP. And now the question about the war in Ukraine was uh, mentioned as well. To begin with the history now, 20 years ago in April, in April, Petr Panchev, the deputy chair of uh, the Bulgarian ecological uh, organization called Ekoglasnost, he requested access to public information according to the law from the Ministry of Energy. Information if there was any decision adopted to restart the Belene NPP. Why did he request this information? Because Belene was a project that was closed in uh, 1990 and 1992 uh, by the National Assembly and the government. But suddenly we started seeing PR tours by the then uh, Minister, Prime Minister, Mr. Saks-Kubrugotsky, uh, saks -Kubrugotte. And uh, we were hearing talks about uh, restarting uh, the construction works for uh, the Belena NPP. And then the ministry uh, lied and said that no such decision was taken. However, the Council of Ministers uh, that we had defeated in some key uh, case, uh, cases under the law for access to public information, the Council of Ministers did provide a copy of an actual decision. This is how we learned that uh, the Belena NPP was restarted. This is when the Ecoglasnos movement and here covering come from Greenpeace filed a petition to the Supreme Administrative Court to dispute the legality of this decision because um, why am I reminding you of this? Because we are in the same situation today again. Once again, it turned out no one had analyzed the technology, the socioeconomic impact, or the nuclear uh, waste and the spent fuel. Back in the day, the Minister of Energy had uh, submitted a proposal to the Council of Ministers that were two pages for construction of a nuclear power plant. And even uh, back then, my uh, colleague said uh, that you need a lot more documents to turn a garage into a coffee shop. Okay, the Council of Ministers uh, did resolve this, and in 2004, the Supreme Administrative Court convened to discuss this issue. Two of the courts uh, of the judges then uh, said that this uh, uh, petition was not admissible because it was just a general uh, decision. And nowadays, we are having the same uh, thing, uh, the story repeat. Uh, Judge Alexander Elenkov, who was the chair of the court panel back in the day, and he was the most senior uh, judge, he uh, had a separate opinion where Petko Kovacev, who also witnessed these uh, events, and some other participants, they agreed. Then uh, Judge Elenkov wrote a five-page opinion where he said that if it was uh, possible to not have court control over a decision like that. Nothing would prevent the government from moving on uh, with actions that would endanger the environment and the life and safety of uh, the citizens. Then in uh, January 2005, a five-panel uh, court, a five-member panel of the court uh, returned to this decision for review by the government. This was when the government realized that it couldn't just act like that. Of course, we had other problems. We had uh, 10,000 pages of documentation that was marked as uh, for official use and was not accessible. We had to fight there. Again, our CEO, Girgano Zhulev, uh, uh, made a lot of noise. Uh, to have access to this information. Yeah, between uh, Christmas and New Year's, exactly. Uh, it was another fight to let us uh, have a public discourse around uh, in, in the next year. Then uh, in, in February 
on your in February 2005 on your resolution was adopted. It was uh, appealed again, and then the Supreme Administrative Court with a three-member panel and then a five-member panel uh, agreed uh, a result that the analysis was completed. The public discourse had been carried out, but we still hadn't uh, didn't have analysis about the nuclear waste and spent fuel. So it's weird uh, if you prove something that doesn't exist, but let me not go into legal uh, details here. The court cases continued about the selection of a site. Uh, Peter Penchev uh, filed another case then about the selection of a site for the NPP and the documentation for the selection of the site, which happened in 2007. Uh, this documentation revealed in uh, a little note uh, hidden under num number 133, it became apparent that the Nuclear Regulatory uh, Commission uh, said uh, that they weren't seeing any analysis about the spent nuclear fuel and radioactive waste in their management. There was nothing. The Supreme Court of uh, Administrative Court was put in a delicate situation where they had retroactively to establish that something hadn't been done years ago. And it conveniently decided that no one could appeal uh, the solution for the selection of the site. In a five-member uh, panel of the court, uh, Judge Elenkov once again dramatically distanced, distanced himself from the opinion of the other members. And once again, he argued that it was very important when we are talking about nuclear uh, facilities for the citizens to be able to defend their rights uh, in front of the court because it was about their health and safety. We have many other cases about access to information. Petko Kovacev had uh, a case like that in his organization. Uh, the Market Economy Institute had cases. Peter Penchev, once again, I won't list everyone. Uh, I have listed them in a, uh, in an article in Medio Pool from 2013. Uh, and we have a text on our newsletter that I can provide to you later to list all of the cases. Uh, so moving on, in 2011, uh, we we had two interesting questions about nuclear facilities. The first one was about the attempt to restart the small nuclear reactor at the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences uh, in Sofia, which was built in the 1950s when I think um, the whole idea about nuclear energy and the nuclear safety rules uh, were at a different level. But there was an attempt for such a restart and an um, environmental impact assessment with a decision from 2013, the Supreme Administrative Court, third panel, uh, cancelled this uh, decision uh, and the environmental impact assessment. This court ruling was confirmed by a five-member panel. Uh, then at the same time, the Glasnost uh, ecological organizations filed a request for a repeal of the environmental impact assessment for a radioactive uh, waste storage depot because it was uh, on the surface and not uh, deep underground. Also in 2011, when this case started, it was initially uh, suspended because for uh, there was a quote, lack of legal interest Unquote, this is something interest, uh, no legal interest for the petitioner. Uh, so a five panel, uh, a five member panel canceled this. Uh, then in 2013, first a third, a three person panel, and then a five person panel of the court once again uh, canceled this environmental impact assessment. And thank God, uh, the Bulgarian government. Uh, pulled back at least this uh, project because it was going to happen in a lively part of the Sofia city with kindergartens and schools and so on. Now this case with the National uh, Nuclear Waste Storage Depot, the environmental impact assessment decision was cancelled because uh, there was a, a regulation uh, there that requested uh, a required a document by the International Nuclear Energy Association. And after this uh, nuclear waste storage depot was canceled, 
because uh, surface level storage was less safe and the law required uh, deep storage. And then the Council of Ministers, in an interesting tactic to pass the ball uh, between the Prime Minister Borisov and uh, Urashavsky, uh, another Prime Minister, uh, the Council of Ministers immediately after this decision uh, cancelled uh, this uh, requirement that introduced the International Nuclear Agency uh, standard. And all of this happened after the Fukushima disaster, and when the entire world saw that it was important to work for more nuclear safety, and the European Union developed its uh, legislation for that purpose. After the cancellation, we had a new case against this cancellation. A three-member panel of the Supreme Court of uh, Administrative Court uh, ruled that the petitioner had no legal interest to file such a petition. Uh, the five-member panel dramatically split uh, three to two, with two judges having a very well-grounded position that uh, it's impossible for a strategy that is required by law to be subject to public discourse. You can that uh, agree that that strategy can be changed without public debate, without clarity about the project, and with no one having the right to even question the validity of such a decision. Now, moving on. In 2015, we had two questions that arose. Question one was about the continuation of the life of units five and six of the Kozul Dui NPP. That Continuation of the, uh, the unit's life was happened with a decision by the Ministry of Environment and Waters uh, about the environmental impact assessment for these activities. Since the petitioners, uh, that once again included the Echo Glasnost movement, since the petitioners questioned this, they were sanctioned with the legal costs of about 20 to 50,000 lefts. And at the end of it, uh, further to the required petition for cancellation, the court said that it uh, agreed that the court, uh, this, the court fees were excessive, so they were return, uh, reduced to 12,000 lefts. And thanks to this ruling by a seven-member court panel, Bulgaria was sentenced uh, at the Strasbourg Court of, uh, with a decision from 2021. Now, later on, uh, there was an environmental impact assessment for Unit 7. This assessment was once again appealed before the court and a three-member panel of the court ruled that the assessment was illegal because it didn't take into account all projects that were planned in uh, the area of nuclear power. Uh, and also, once again, yet again, it hadn't resolved the issue of nuclear waste and uh, spent nuclear fuel. The court rescinded that decision. Just let me say here that uh, Judge Donka Chakarova was the uh, leading judge. She uh, still works. And so a five-member panel of the court cancelled this decision. And then also, I think, uh, a seven-member panel later on refused to cancel it. And this is how we laid the previous uh, ruling on the court case before the current one in the Belene NPP saga. In 2018, the chairs of the two political parties, uh, uh, the Democrats and Yes Bulgaria, they filed a petition against a ruling of the Council of Ministers, a new ruling that was uh, slightly obscured to restart the Belena NPP. This restart was 
carried out in a comical but also tragical manner in terms of the potential outcomes. They cancelled the decision to cancel the decision for the construction of Belene. Since the Supreme Administrative Court, a uh, fourth panel, provided instructions under K the case from 2018 that said that it, uh, political parties could not be accepted as interesting interested petitioners, then the court case was continued by the chairs of the two parties, Atanas Atanasov on behalf of the uh, Democrats for Free Bulgaria Party, on, but acting as an individual, and Christo Ivanov, who was the chair and continues to be chair of the Yes Bulgaria Party, once again acting as an individual. Then, uh, in the beginning of 2021, Prior to that, the Supreme Court Administrative Court had uh, ruled that uh, the entire society was uh, affected by this matter, and the case was announced in the Bulgarian State Gazette, but then the leading judge retired in the beginning of 2021 and uh, ended the case by saying that no one had the legal interest to dispute a decision to build a nuclear power plant. Even though the uh, deadline for appeal of this decision was missed, and uh, we will leave the question why unanswered. Regardless, we managed to uh, fix the deadline with uh, Christo Ivanov's uh, petition, and we appealed before a five member panel uh, that made the appropriate ruling. After this, uh, historical review, now we are leaving the moment where the decision to build Unit 7 and 8 was adopted without a single analysis, without a single word. Unlike the proposal by the Minister of Energy in 2004, where the two pages and uh, proposal also had a little, a small report, uh, I forgot by whom was it by uh, yeah and Wally Parsons and Deloitte uh, yeah so Deloitte and Wally Parsons uh, so it was a twenty page report by Wally Parsons back in the day now we don't even have a, a two page report about the technology or any other of the questions under uh, the Bulgarian law instead we woke up one day uh, in, at the beginning of this month of March 2024 with yet another secretly proposed cancellation of the entire procedure uh, under the Bulgarian uh, Safe Use of Nuclear Energy Act without public discourse uh, proposed by Mr. Delian Dobrev and his colleague from the Bulgarian DSP party, uh, uh, DSP par party. Uh, this um, proposal was voted on, and we are yet to see what it's about. Uh, I think, in conclusion, that uh, the topic of nuclear energy in Bulgaria obviously is uh, was subject to a uh, huge interest, which also leads to adoption of non-transparent hasty decisions without analysis, without studies, without public debate, and with uh, uh, strong pressure on the judiciary being uh, applied. And we can see this, uh, that despite of this, our judiciary has managed to protect people's rights with a decision here and there, but it's been difficult. Thank you, uh, Attorney Krishamov. This sounds like an endless stream of uh, ever-repeating stories over the years. And I am now tempted to ask, has there been anything that's been done according to the procedures that you have been able to find? And I have a second very short question. Is there a new generation of people who are asking questions? Because I can tell you right now that you are working with a people 
with those people who know a lot, they have been through a lot. Uh, and I am very happy that you haven't had burnout in all those years that you've experienced uh, all these things and still are, you're able to go strong. But is there a new generation coming? Um, I mean, thank you. Thank you for the question. I'll try to be as brief as possible. So because I've always been an optimist, I believe many things have been done over the years. The very fact that the governments wanted to look for the support of the parliament to wash their hands clear of this absurd referendum, which was once again to dilute responsibility. Um, still, because they play this game quite a lot, it shows a certain level of development. Unfortunately, uh, I believe that uh, the idea of having some development was basically, basically collapsed in my mind because there were some politicians who said basically that there is no grounds to dispute any decisions for a nuclear power plant and it's possible to actually make this deci these decisions uh, without any uh, analysis or uh, assessments. So, uh, new people. One of the uh, appellants uh, in this case is Mr. Peter Kajuk, who is a young guy, uh, but he's a um, free electron. He has work with NGOs, uh, he's associated with NGOs, but there is not a, like a larger circle of people who are acting together. And then uh, now Professor Kaschiev and all the other researchers in the terms of academia, academic knowledge, I uh, uh, believe that it's uh, the younger generation doesn't represent so well in this uh, regard, although I'm very happy to see that uh, uh, our colleagues here from uh, uh, C are uh, the, the colleague here from C. He's a bit younger, and so I think we are tired. I think Peter Penchik is already eight years old. Uh, we can't all be just the same, uh, you know, all same, all same old people carrying the torch. Uh, Sasha, thank you for this very detailed uh, statement. I've forgotten maybe more than half of these things, and it's maybe. It maybe would be even good to write this, uh, to put it in writing. So, uh, some clarifications, by the way, when uh, Judge Elenkov wrote his uh, special opinion, and then the five member committee returned, uh, repealed the commission to the third uh, uh, three member committee, there was no longer a dissenting opinion. And I'm going to explain why. So, uh, Konstantin Penchev, the Supreme Administrative uh, Council president at the time, used his repression tactics. Uh, to the utmost to repress the dissenting judge and the dissenting judge afterwards wrote an opinion that he's very sorry for dissenting. And this is one of the worst things that the on these matters that the Supreme Administrative Court has done. Now, on the symbiosis between the parliament and the government right now that we've been uh, seeing for the last uh, few years, this is the dirty little secret of the so-called uh, political uh, assembly because the Council of Ministers refuses to act, but then the parliament says, act because we are going to support you. And this first decision that they took started with a stupid thing that the Vazrajane political party did. Uh, everybody liked it, though. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the Constitution Court is in on it. Uh, with this uh, lawsuit about Kosovo, which uh, has a definition that they are not going to proceed forward with this because a decision of the parliament on Kosovo, which was in January 2021, uh, when there were two awful decisions, one was for Maritza East for power plant and the other was for Kosovo, they are not going to proceed forward because there were no strategy for development of the energy market and the energy situation. This uh, decision substituted the part for the nuclear uh, energy. And it was a strategic document. It's, it was crazy. I'm going to send you the number, read it. But, you know, the conspiracy at the moment is at a very high level, and there is no state institution to support real action and legality. Thank you. May I add to what you just said? Yeah, uh, indeed, this uh, political assembly, this um, 
uh, horrific combination. Let me give you another uh, manifestation <laughs> of their action. So you remember that uh, units five and six uh, uh, useful life cycle was extended um, a few years ago. But there were um, complaints uh, about the um, NGOs uh, from uh, Romania and Serbia that to extend the lifespan, there were supposed to be environmental impact assessments done. And this was actually reasonable as a request because main components were substituted. That is, for example, generators and uh, turbines. A lot of uh, buildings have been built on top of the surface. And the colleagues from Cosmo, they basically said, well, we did these and these many modernization um, and refurbishment measures. But when we see that, for example, uh, 20, 220 modernizations have been done, it seems as if it's a substantial change. And there was a huge battle uh, to actually, um, you know, under this convention, really make a judicial ruling uh, against Bulgaria. And there was an agreement in place instead where the next time a license is issued, then environmental impact assessment should be done. So what did the parliament do? Uh, uh, headed by uh, Mr. Delan Dobrev, the infamous Mr. Delan Dobrev, they uh, filed a proposal where that the operation uh, license uh, would be changed. So instead of every 10 years uh, renewal, it's termless. And so if it's termless, then there is no extension and there is no environmental impact assessment. And they said, we scored the, the goal that we took the lead with. You know, it's one zero to us. And uh, there is now, now an environmental impact assessment for Unit 8. But none of the people uh, who are affected by failure to comply with the agreement, they're not going to look at this question in a gentlemanly way. They're instead... I have to say, going to be as obstructionist as possible. So this is uh, what the situation is. Thank you. As a moderator, I uh, uh, really find it very difficult to uh, really uh, stop you from speaking because I think everything is very relevant. But now I have to give the floor to the next panelist, Professor Stuy Wolf. Uh, may I ask uh, to uh, load the presentation on the screen? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dear colleagues, dear friends, first of all, accept my um, sincere gratitude Please ex accept my sincere gratitude for the uh, trust uh, that you uh, bestow upon me and the invitation to participate in your discussion on the topic of the green transition and whether Bulgaria has a new uh, nuclear power plant. In this presentation, I would like to say a few words about the green transition as part of a uh, large-scale global process, then the energy development and its strategic planning, and then I'm going to answer the specific question whether Bulgaria needs new nuclear power. It's uh, a popular opinion uh, that the uh, term a green transition or green economy uh, have started since 2019 when the European Commission has published the documents on the so-called um, Green New Deal, but the, actually the green transition has a much longer history. The roots of the green transition are, can be found in analysis of the European and global civilization after the Industrial Revolution, which the great uh, Hungarian economist Karl Polony has uh, created and published in 1944, he created the Great Transformation Term, which stipulates uh, changing of the national economies globally to avoid the harm on the planet Earth and the ecosystems, as well as the um, uh, reverse uh, impact uh, on, of these uh, changes on, the, on, on the humankind. Many years have passed and many activities have been done on developing the Polanyi philosophy. And in 1980, for the first time, um, the sustainable development was used officially for the first time. In my opinion, 
the correct translation should be, uh, and there is a translation book, you know, which is not translatable back in English, but basically um, he believes that, you know, I believe that this is a wrong translation of Bulgarian. Uh, regarding the development of uh, humanity and the planet in the report of the International, International Union for Conservation and Nature. And 35 more years passed, uh, while the sustainability uh, goals for the planet, the humankind and the uh, animal, um, animal kind and uh, animal uh, uh, societies have been adopted by the heads of state in 2020. These sustainability goals, have been defined in compliance with multiple circumstances which impact the development of the public and its globalization through mutual planning of industrial and energy technology, the economics, the environment, including the climate, and last but not least, in terms of state of the art and importance, the so-called IoT, Internet of Things, as a combination or a focal point of information technologies and public relationships. For some time, these goals were converted into ideology, ideology, politics, and business of the global corporations. But lately, they have been um, sh a shadow has been cast on them by some darker actions. Now, the world, Europe, and Bulgaria are going through a new great transition for the creation of a new global uh, order and achieving certain goals uh, for 2050. It's uh, different, uh, however, from the idealistic uh, road to sustainable development. Through it, the national energy economies are going through a great energy transition as part of the geopolitical processes, which determine the future of the planet through using some huge uh, human material and financial means. Planning of these steps on these transitions is a supreme uh, science, which uh, in the uh, old uh, European world uh, is uh, basically in the United States of America uh, has been uh, developing for more than a hundred years. And then during the transition in Bulgaria, it was uh, um, basically destroyed. Uh, and uh, just uh, the first uh, monograph on this topic was uh, uh, published and uh, many of you actually know it already. Uh, this uh, uh, monograph uh, is called Planning of the National Energy. But this uh, title, a uh, very pretentious title, should not be scaring you um, with the idea of this uh, difficult uh, uh, matter. Um, there is no uh, complex uh, models, uh, but actually very compelling and systematized knowledge uh, in the other um, economic systems and the uh, overall uh, ideas for public development. Uh, I think in the book you will find uh, some very well argumented answers to the questions of the energy transitions, um, including the current transition towards uh, green energy and economics. So, for example, in the first part of the book, we have uh, uncovered some uh, main knowledge and important knowledge on uh, energy and um, power engineering through which you will be able to rethink and supplement your knowledge on the importance of different uh, various energy sources and energy uh, carriers, energy uh, transformations and their impact, uh, which of them are green and which of the energy technologies are green and the respective energy in nature, environmental protection, economical, public and other characteristics. I would like to invite all of you to uh, review the contents of uh, all of the materials that I have provided. They are available also uh, in the platforms that are the disseminating this uh, book, biblio.bg, helicon.bg, and so on.bg. Now let's proceed to answering the question of today, the relevant question for today's event. Does Bulgaria need new nuclear power? First answer to the question, is there a need? The short answer is no. This is not my response. It is part of the integrated plan in the area of uh, energy and uh, climate in the Republic of Bulgaria for the period 2021-2030, adopted by the Ministry of Energy and the Ministry of Environment and Water in 2020.
pages 17, 162, and 257 of this plan uh, stipulate that the new 2,000 megawatts of nuclear power are not necessary for the national uh, energy uh, mix, but they are instead designated to be exported. I am not going to talk about who is going to gain from this export and who has financed uh, this text in the so-called plan, because you all know the public secret, and I'm going to proceed and answer the, the, give you the second answer. The second short answer is contained in another document published on February the 23rd, the year 2023, by the Ministry of Energy, which is named aptly Strategic Vision for Sustainable Development of the Electric, electric Power Sector of the Republic of Bulgaria for the period 2023-2053. This document with uh, really corrupted content includes the same hypothesis, which is harmful to the state. Bulgaria should build at least two nuclear uh, uh, units with 1,000 megawatts per capacity for exporting electric power. But there are some other harmful uh, policies. Uh, this is the, uh, um, on multiple occasion, occasion the uh, a policy which is harmful to the nation uh, is being praised as Bulgaria being the exporter, traditional net exporter of electric power for the whole region. And one of the main strategic goals for 2053 is preserving and upgrading this role. Why it should be like that? It nobody has said. But uh, many other significant factors do exist which cause harm to the Bulgarian state uh, from the development of uh, Unit 7 and 8 in uh, NPP Kosovo. I have described those in an open letter to the President, Prime Minister, the Chair of the Council of Ministers, the, uh, the, the, the Attorney General, the, the President of the Bulgarian uh, uh, Academy of Sciences and the latest uh, president of the National Association, Eko Kvasnost. The substantial part of the letter is uh, stated in 17 pages and the uh, used literature, uh, five more pages. It can be uh, downloaded or read uh, from the webpage energyplanning.bg.net uh, um, uh, and then publica publicatie in in Latin letters. The letter was uh, filed to the file uh, uh, keeping offices of the respective state institutions on January the 10th of this year. As you may probably guess, so far, not even one institution has chosen to respond. In the slides that follow, I have uh, selected some short um, excerpts to push you towards a more active uh, um, uh, responses. Is the operation of nuclear power of the type AP-1000 in the Bulgarian uh, electric energy system uh, admissible? Is it admissible? For this particular type of uh, power facility, the answer is again, no. Because, first of all, because of the energy lack of efficiency, working at the full capacity, energy efficiency uh, factor is not surpassing 33%. Uh, for the lower temperature and the steam pressure compared to the other steam power stations. And then this coefficient, as Professor Peschev has uh, on multiple occasions uh, emphasized, that it uh, should uh, operate with a lower than the full power, which would be inevitable. Then, uh, lack of uh, economical feasibility. According to the World Bank, Lazard and other financial institutions globally, the value of the new designed uh, power stations is higher than the highest ones. So this is, these are the additional prices of the uh, power energy market and the capital uh, no longer can be reimbursed or the capital investment can no longer be returned within a reasonable, feasible time frame. Uh, and then another possibility is because of the high, higher prime cost of the um, uh, price of electric power um, generated by other operating uh, uh, aggregates and uh, wide range uh, and the uh, impossibility to, for a frequent uh, uh, up cycle and down cycle or uh, start up uh, and, uh, and shut down, which somewhat has been overcome in the French reactors, but not in... Uh, uh, Bulgaria, for example, in the technology that we're going to implement. 
Then another uh, issue is uh, impossibility to uh, make it cheaper. So uh, among all energy technologies from 1974 to 2008, the International uh, Energy Agency member states have uh, it put in the most money for technological improvements in nuclear power, which would decrease the prime cost of the generated nuclear power. The results are not acceptable for the um, uh, investors because the uh, leveled uh, or prices of electric, levelized cost of energy, LCOE, uh, of uh, nuclear uh, power stations without subsidies have only ever been rising. Over the course of this time, the technology for generation of uh, um, electricity from renewable energy sources are being um, are using much less funds, but the uh, uh, cost is decreasing. The um, uh, investment in photovoltaic power plants is now being recouped for four or five years, and in uh, uh, wind power plants, less than a year, and that is why. The rich countries have stopped uh, building nuclear power in Spain, uh, uh, United States, uh, Luxembourg, uh, Spain, Denmark, Portugal, Switzerland, and so on, to continue generating the revenues for the respective nuclear industries. The owner uh, now have uh, focused the activities on funding and building nuclear power, uh, power plants in eastern countries, which agree to use the um, to, to invest in lower rate of return, which is the uh, lower uh, in terms of the investment threshold. The difference between the two norms indicates the degree of uh, the respective country uh, become poorer because of, uh, of the implementation. Uh, and the last uh, uh, factor is uh, failure to pay for externalities. The economic consequences of uh, all damaging uh, emissions, harmful emissions, affect not only the buyers on the respective energy product, but also all the um, people on Earth. And the uh, determination of the value of the costs of, uh, um, of these um, harmful processes, this is a complex process, which is characterized by separate economic category externalities. And so the public price for a single energy product becomes part of the uh, uh, pri uh, the private, the clear, inherent in the um, public or the external. And so the um, uh, mon monetary expression of the nuclear um, failures could reach uh, tens and uh, hundreds of billions of euro. And the society has a huge uh, level of uh, disconcernment on uh, such uh, failures. And there is no... Uh, um, the trading systems and emission systems do not uh, include uh, provisions for payment uh, of uh, uh, the cost for such failures, catastrophic failures. And so the conclusion is that nuclear power plants are not equal to the other systems on uh, payments for externalities because all other energy installations are paying for uh, discharge, uh, uh, greenhouse gases and so on, other harmful emissions, but nobody pays for nuclear um, the nuclear externalities. And the conclusion now is whether Bulgaria would be able to participate with a profit and um, benefit or a loss in the transition toward uh, low carbon uh, economics. And the answer to this question depends on the quality of development of the planning process of the Bulgarian national energy. Such uh, planning so far, um, state planning is actually uh, absent. Um, it's uh, there are no other organizations which are systemically uh, in an organized manner or with uh, submitted uh, organized uh, information would be working on these matters, and that is why we are always ill prepared to ensure that we can make the decisions in this way as the attorney. Uh, at law, Kashumov already mentioned also, the this process is not done systematically and it's not created systematically. But let me give you some evaluations. At the global, 
financial specialists are evaluating that as a result of the transition to a low carbon uh, economy, the global um, financial systems would gain additional revenues of $1.5 trillion, uh, depending on the actions and the policies undertaken and the transition for the low carbon uh, emissions transportation could uh, gain 3.5 billion dollars or lose 2.5 billion dollars but all of this depends on energy planning and unfortunately we don't have energy planning in Bulgaria now let's ask a rhetorical question is Bulgaria going toward profit uh, or towards a loss by the so called uh, uh, gap in the energy security uh, because of uh, which based on which uh, energy uh, prices uh, should be increased for the end consumers the uh, basically the uh, governors are saying or the uh, that the gap is caused by uh, uh, the decrease of end price towards user and i think that this gap is actually caused by the um, the transfer of a billion and a half uh, Bulgarian level to the new nuclear powers enterprise and the rising of course would only be the first action of the road that we have taken towards nuclear power. There are acting uh, the financial and economic experts and they can analyze and tell us who's wrong and who's right on this. But now I'd like to wrap up by uh, returning you to the um, thoughts of the large scale um, of this issue uh, for which we have been all gathered here today by our gracious folks, Zazimata, when the Institute of Nuclear Research and uh, Nuclear Energy uh, had basically banned this, uh, the publication of this prepared book in the, by the publication house of uh, the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences, I was really astonished by the uh, censorship that existed in the biggest scientific organization in the country, which... Uh, is uh, done in the conditions of a democratic Bulgaria. And when the leaders of 25 countries have signed the declaration for triple increase of the um, nuclear power capacities, I was also um, uh, really appalled at the uh, attitude towards the uh, countries that are on the bottom of this ranking, let's say. So the conclusion and new challenges, when the uh, Parliament uh, started uh, managing the plans for developing Unit 7 and 8 of the NPP because the, through its decisions, I was also appalled at the strict and very um, st uh, urgently organized anti-state uh, and anti-humanity actions, which far exceeds uh, the climate uh, change. And uh, in this uh, globality of the issue, the personal horror uh, experienced by a single citizen and a single scientist is just a drop in uh, in, in the bucket. But uh, the organized uh, discussion by the uh, hosts uh, gathers a lot of drops in the bucket. But even those drops, many drops are not enough to return uh, to the 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 or get out to the world um, and to return all of this to the world uh, to solve this issue. We need uh, a whole ocean of drops. And now, please allow me to uh, thank the Science uh, Research uh, Fund uh, for making sure that this research was well funded and for the publication of this uh, book. Thank you. And you have the floor for. Uh, thank you. As someone who I read your book, it's uh, a comprehensive and understandable course in uh, nuclear energy. So I would recommend it to anyone who is interested in this topic. Now, a uh, provocative question that I have asked before, but now I would like to repeat in public. The regional picture, we mentioned about it, that many countries are uh, trying to build new nuclear capacity here in the region. Countries like Slovakia, who have 60% of nuclear power in their energy mix, they're also planning new capacities in uh, the Czech Republic we have 35 to 40 percent in the energy mix some of these countries really have a substantial uh, share of nuclear power in their portfolio now countries like Poland who are just starting on the on this road if they succeed 
uh, their nuclear power will be like low 20s uh, in terms of a percentage of the total power in the country. Now, about the idea that uh, the energy mix should have a little bit of nuclear power is that uh, nuclear power helps hydroelectric power if uh, the nuclear share is about one-fifth of the total mix. Now, when we think of a base nuclear capacity, uh, if we look at it on a chart, we have a consumption that varies. We have uh, hydroelectric uh, production that also varies, and we need to balance them out. And we have the base, basic nuclear or other capacity that helps stabilize everything. How can nuclear capacity be of help? Can they uh, provide more flexibility or not? Uh, can how can they help the development of renewable energy sources? Thank you, Mr. Komparov. The question is uh, indeed interesting, and it gives me the opportunity to say that recently, based on this uh, so-called base, uh, the approach to base capacities has changed. We no longer have the classic uh, term. Nowadays, uh, base Capacity has to be viewed in a different manner or we have to just drop it as a term because the classic term of base capacity supposes that this is the cheapest source of energy in the portfolio of uh, the energy portfolio of a, an energy company, for example that the energy company uses to approach the market. So this base capacity has to be the cheapest one, has to be uh, constantly uh, operating and not subject to change. Now, recently, uh, nuclear capacity has ceased to be cheap. Nuclear power, therefore, just doesn't fit the requirements. The definition of basic uh, capacity, nuclear power, is much more ex expensive than the energy pro uh, produced by photovoltaics and uh, wind turbines. Every energy company that has a portfolio and offers uh, their energy on an energy exchange, first, strives to use as much as possible uh, as as much renewable energy as possible. Now, after the renewables are constructed, they have to be utilized to the fullest extent, of course. And because of this, and because nuclear power plants, even if we assume that they are the next uh, best priced in the comparison of uh, energy production, which is not true, but if we assume it is like that, in such a case, nuclear power plants must participate in the regulation of the energy mix. They have to compensate for uh, variance in the uh, load that happens uh, with uh, renewable energy sources that has. So they have nuclear, can nuclear power plants act as such a balancing factor in the energy mix? No, obviously not, as Professor Kostyev, uh stated a number of times. In the base nuclear uh, base energy capacities, the new base capacities that have to operate 100% of the time and to be utilized to their utmost are indeed capacities that have uh, zero variance in their cost. But uh, here we have. Uh, um, emulsion-based uh, construction of nuclear power plant units, but they have an energy component uh, uh, than the nuclear fuel and spent fuel uh, disposal are not free or cheap. 
Thank you. That's all. Hello, Professor Stuilov. Uh, thank you by Georg uh, Stefanov. Uh, uh, I'm also a Yonis. Do you know that a uh, couple of days ago, Associate Professor Nasko Georgiev opened a new master's degree program for nuclear technology management and innovations? Now, my question to all other panelists is at the end of the day, everyone we listened to and everyone we're going to listen to, don't you think that we should also work on education because this new master's degree program was opened with the nuclear regulatory agency and others? Let me not list everyone. Uh, some participants have made some mistakes in the past, but if we want to teach students uh, and uh, show them the bad practices and the good solutions, I don't know what's going to happen. So what do you think I can uh, help you assist with the uh, my colleagues to discuss education, basically? Thank you, Mr. Stefanov, for your question. Of course, I know that such a, a specialty in the business department exists. I, I, I knew that it was going to be opened. I didn't know it happened a few times ago, but anyway, unfortunately, Yes, I know Associate Professor Gurgiev very well. He's a respected Bulgarian um, specialist in economy, dean of the business uh, faculty of the Sofia University. But even though he is part of our team of scientists uh, for this project with the Scientific Research Fund, for some time, we have been unable to get in touch to discuss the issue that you mentioned with your question. And I personally think that indeed we shouldn't deceive our future experts, our future leaders in the energy system, and nuclear power in uh, the condition it has right now, especially with the AP1000 uh, technology, it has no place in our energy system. Thank you. Because the question was asked to all panelists, I'll just uh, ask that we uh, keep it for the final words. And now we go on to Martin Vudmiru from the Democracy Studies Center, uh, our next panelist. Um, let me just say now that Europe is uh, has been divided in two camps in uh, the last two years. On one hand, we have the proponents of renewable energy sources uh, or friends of renewables, or and the other camp uh, with France at the forefront. They promote the idea of nuclear power and continued development of nuclear capacities. Martin, you have the floor. Uh, we. Uh, we, we don't have audio. Okay. So for 10 years now, we have been worked on Bulgarian energy and we have been trying to make Bulgarian authorities adopt some of the assumptions and logic of these models. So I disagree that no one is trying to work on long-term planning for the Bulgarian energy system and the Bulgarian economy because uh, the transformation is connected not just to the Bulgarian energy system, but uh, it's connected to decarbonization as a whole of all sectors like industry, transportation, buildings, and agriculture, and so on. Today, however, I will uh, talk about energy and uh, electricity in particular, because this uh, topic has been monopolizing uh, most of the public discourse in Bulgaria. My presentation has a bit of a boring title because I think part of the reason for the uh, the title is uh, uh, an overtaken energy system in an overtaken country. And uh, so I think a lot of statements are not based on data and facts and long-term forecasts and analysis, but uh, the numbers are being doctored to make them fit uh, certain private interests or foreign interests, whether it's uh, French, American, or uh, American or Russian, it doesn't matter. 
our institutions in the Bulgarian energy system have been uh, taken over and they are in fact have been turned into to quote uh, colleague cash and carry meaning whoever gives the cash uh, um, will see their interest being carried forward to explain this model we have some uh, custom made analysis that uh, have significant political interests pulling the strings behind the scenes that aim to justify certain investments and uh, now i want to turn to the leaders in the bulgarian energy analysis and plamen svetanov who passed away uh, god rest his soul but in 2006 he made a counter analysis of another analysis that was published by the bulgarian uh, energy commission about the expected consumption of electricity in Bulgaria. And that analysis was ordered to justify the construction of the Bellinen NPP. And correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, that analysis thought that by 2020, Bulgaria would consume 60 terawatt hours of uh, electricity. Maybe I'm uh, a bit incorrect, but uh, 62, thank you. Uh, so uh, that analysis expected a doubling of consumption, but in reality, the difference between 2006 and 2020 is negligible. So we instead uh, had a stagnation of energy consumption. And as Plum and Fatanov wrote a detailed scientific paper back in the day that no one paid attention to, perhaps about, uh, in, apart from the um, Center for uh, Study of Democracy. So this analysis uh, said uh, the opposite. In view of the Bulgarian energy development and the restructuring of the Bulgarian economy and uh, transition towards uh, services and more energy efficiency, we are not going to have an increased consumption. And he was right. Now to fast forward to 2024, once again in the revised uh, version of that forecast, they expect a significant increase of energy usage. And once again, that was a result of uh, an assignment by some foreign interests from last uh, year that also showed an expected substantial increase of energy usage in Bulgaria. So this study uh, gives a lot of power to uh, coal energy and nuclear energy that have merged into one and they have extremely strong positions on the Bulgarian market and uh, they have a number of companies in uh, the circle around Mr. Kovacki but not just himself and everyone there is uh, super happy our state forecasting and state planning has always tried to serve the interests of certain circles in Bulgaria. And within this context, we asked the European Commission last year to not allow this lobbying to be used as a foundation for uh, Bulgarian strategic planning. I don't think we succeeded, but at least in the Energy Transition Commission, we managed to agree on a more moderate uh, forecast, and I will show it to you. It's based on the cooperation between the European Commission and us and the Hungarian Institute. And it's based on more logical assumptions about energy consumption and investment in various capacities. This study that was used as a foundation for the report we published about the energy transition, this study was uh, presented in a distorted manner and some of its main results were outright dismissed and uh, someone just said, no, we need a nuclear power plant, two paragraphs. Uh, but they never proved the need for a nuclear power plant. It, it was just added on. And they just said, no, we will have twice more energy usage and we need a, an NPP, and this is our long-term vision about Bulgarian energy. So what did we do with the commission and our Hungarian colleagues? Let me show you. These are to, to show you the differences with the current version 
we reviewed two scenarios, just as the Energy Transition Commission did. One scenario of a late uh, transitioning out of coal by uh, 2040 and an early transition by 2030. Uh, both of them don't uh, plan for new coal capacity. So uh, why are we focusing on coal energy? Because uh, Bulgarian energy is uh, the, it's all based on the decarbonization speed. As we know, two thirds of the emissions in our energy production come from coal and gas. This is why the emphasis of our models is there. Of course, we also have uh, assumptions for all technologies to be able to see what can and cannot replace our coal-based power plants. So here are the results. According to our models, coal-based plants will remain a key source of energy until 2025, 2026, and afterwards uh, they will be rapidly opted out of the system. And by 2030, only the delayed scenario provides for existing coal capacities. In the early transition scenario, we have no coal, and not for political reasons, but because these uh, plants will not be competitive to the market and they will shut down for economic reasons, which is a favorite motto of many politicians in Bulgaria that they use to try and bury their hand in the head in the sand. Uh, when it's time to allocate subsidies, they can say, oh, it's not us, it's some bad guys who allocated the subsidies. None of these coal plants will be able to operate without subsidies after 2025 and should shut down uh, unless they come up with a new secret way to fund them. Uh, and we su suspect that the changes to the Bulgarian Energy Act aim to accomplish this, meaning uh, under the guise of liberalization uh, to reinvent the funding of coal-based plants through the, our energy system security fund from uh, 2025 onwards. You can see a mess... Uh, increase of the share of photovoltaics and wind power. This is nothing new and there's no need to repeat the obvious, which is that private investment in the sector leads to a growth of wind power of, from to five gigawatts by 2013, seven gigawatts for photovoltaics by 2013. And from that point on, uh, the growth is exponential. You can see uh, in parallel, we do not expect our system to incorporate new nuclear capacities because, as the previous speakers uh, explained in detail, the price of nuclear power production will not be competitive to the market. And I will show you why in a little bit. We've uh, done a modeling of the prices in Southeast uh, Europe until 2030, and they do not exceed 100 euro per megawatt hour. So this means that even in the most optimistic scenario, a nuclear power plant just cannot be profitable. To become profitable, uh, it should... Maybe we can decommission early units five and six in order to reduce the uh, supply on the market and potentially the prices in Southeast Europe, because as you know, this nuclear power plant uh, plays a key role in Southeast Europe for the entire region in terms of covering energy needs. A uh, much more important role will be played by batteries, and by batteries we do not only mean uh, lithium-ion batteries, but also uh, other ones for... Uh, other types of nuclear power plants that are key to the entire region. It will be important to uh, repair as quickly as possible our uh, accumulating and pumping uh, hydroelectric plants. As many experts are saying, this model shows a re relatively low amount of usage of uh, gas and coal plants and a low amount of uh, usage of the battery storage capacity for at least 10 uh, years. Of course, coal is still central and is 
important and in the years to come you will see a 40 percent percent utilization rate of coal but it will decrease sharply uh, later on and uh it will drop down to about five percent or less what happens with the uh, demand our model shows that the energy demand will increase by 11 percent between 2025 and 2030 and by about 40 percent by 2050 due to the uh, gradual electrification of many sectors including industry and transportation but to a large extent uh, the more ambitious forecasts about energy usage in Bulgaria are based on unrealistic assumptions of full electrification of transport, something we do not think is feasible for a multiplicity of factors, including socioeconomic factors. And also these models fail to account for the fact that Bulgaria is already highly electrified. It's uh, one of the most electrified countries in Europe. And the potential for additional electrification is small because the use of natural gas in us is insignificant. It's focused mostly in uh, the industrial sector and in uh, thermoelectric power plants. Well, thermoelectric power plants are gradually being phased out. It remains to see how long it will take because there are some bottomless pits there that are being filled in. But in our industry, we have about 10% of uh, the plants who are generating most of the gas consumption, uh, but they all have plans for uh, electricity or switch to biomass, emission, carbon capture, carbon capture and storage, and many other technologies, hydrogen, etc. Of course, these technologies are still uh, not commercially applied, and it will take some time until they penetrate the market but we are not expecting a huge electrification that already hasn't been accomplished the industries that can be electrified are mostly electrified already uh, well, this is what i meant when i was talking about prices in the region you can see that by 2050 the maximum scenario is for about 110 euro per megawatt hour while in the period of the potential inclusion of the two new units of the Kozludui MPP, the price will be about 90 to 95 euro. To make an important clarification here, uh, as Professor Kachiev did, uh, the Center for the Study of Democracy is not opposed to new nuclear capacity construction, but they should be used to replace units five and six. And the decision for that needs to happen a lot later. Why? we can see a huge evolution of technological revolution, not evolution, it's a revolution. And we do not know by 2035 uh, 20, uh, what's going to happen with battery technologies, the effectiveness of uh, wind power technologies. We may have another revolutionary methods to reduce consumption and so on. Therefore, it is so early for us to get locked down in a huge traditional nuclear power capacity when we can have much more efficient technologies in the future. So our motto here is let us wait. We have time. Now is not the time to invest in a huge capacity like that. And probably this will generate a huge fiscal deficit for Bulgaria in the next 30 years if this decision is adopted. So we have uh, major economic factors that say we shouldn't be hasty with a decision like that. As you can see, these are the emissions. Uh, let's, uh, we're not going to talk about emissions that much here, but the phasing out of coal plants from the system will uh, solve to a large extent the problem with emissions in our system. Not 100%, but coal is the main problem, and I think it will be naturally resolved. The big scare for all uh, Facebook experts is that we are all going to die by two main uh, ways. First, being in the dark and secondly, being in the cold in winter. Our forecasts show that even if we phase out all coal plants in southeastern Europe and do not build any new capacities in the Kozlodui NPP by 2050, because after 2050, none of us will be here probably, <laughs> until that point we see no 
shortage of electricity and uh, we don't think there will be a lack of backup capacity for the system and this uh, happens even if we have extremely high electricity prices meaning that our system will still be uh, perfectly adequate by 2050. This means that we may not have 100%, as Mr. Tsachev insists, but it might be 99.9999, but it may be 20% and everything will be fine still because uh, no one stops uh, electricity at the border. It continues. Uh, now, I am being a bit ironic uh, here on purpose because, uh, unfortunately, the level of the debate is, has been brought low by others, so we have to take this into account. We think that the cooperation between um, energy system operators in Southeast Europe is important. They need to do their homework, sit together and come up with a better way to manage the new large uh, hydroelectric capacities instead of just moaning about, oh, we're all going to die. No. And speaking of this, the uh, restriction of uh, hydroelectric uh, uh, plants in the system uh, remains insignificant, uh, even though, in, despite the huge uh, increase in production, of course, this means uh, low prices, zero prices, negative prices, etc. But there are other approaches to uh, deal with this, like storage systems and so on. Um, but it's uh, the solution is not a centralized um, stoppage of the plants. What can we do and what follows? And just to repeat some of the conclusions, we have to speed up the phasing out of coal plants from the energy system because they just uh, accumulate uh, losses and we are uh, arguing about them a lot. We don't think the discussion about energy security has something to do with the budget. We have to come up with a way to continue transferring money from uh, emission quota sales to other to other directions like uh, decarbonization. This is the main question to debate. No one is mentioning it. This is why we need to uh, uh, remove the state support mechanisms for coal and gas. Let's see if it happens. I think that somewhere in the transitory and final provisions of some act in the future, there will be an obligation to protect the financial health of the Maritza East to thermoelectric power plants in all perpetuity. Um, of course, this means that by um, December 2020, something, a couple of thousand miners will charge at the Council of Ministers uh, because no one will have provided them with a clear schedule for the energy transformation and they will find themselves uh, jobless overnight. And because of that, we will have to cut all kinds of deals with the devil. Um, billions of euro will once again be sunk into the bottomless pit called uh, Maritza East. Now, new nuclear capacities uh, make no economic sense and will cause an early discontinuation of Units 5 and 6. We think the decision for Units 5 and 6 have to uh, happen after 2050. We shouldn't build too much store energy storage capacities, especially with uh, public funds. Uh, now, if it happens on, an, uh, on a market-based uh, principle by all large investors that are running most of the capital in Bulgaria. Well, this is something else. I think they have enough money to build up their battery capacities. Of course, they will uh, appropriate a large percentage of the money, but that's another topic. Now, uh, finally, the transition of Bulgarian energy needs to face the citizens. This is what we always insist upon. Um, instead of uh, facing the large players on the market. This is why we need an overall regulatory framework for uh, uh, participation of the households and uh, small SMEs. They will solve the problems with over consumption uh, and increased consumption in winter. It can probably be resolved with slightly more reasonable measures for decentralization of energy usage and others and then I don't know how it will be possible to justify a uh, gas power plant of even 200 megawatts. Now we need a new energy 
strategy based on data that needs to be constantly updated due to the ever-changing technology and it needs to be led by experts and interesting parties in a transparent platform like the Energy Transition Commission. Thank you, Martin. I have two questions and then I'm going to give the floor through Zoom to Dr. Valentin Simeon. Question number one, because uh, you're working a lot on the topic of uh, wind power. I just didn't mention it because there are so many people who doesn't like, who, who don't like, they don't like it. But um, how is wind within the framework of our consumption helps balance the other important uh, renewable energy source, which is now coming onto the market, the solar power. Do you have some schedule? Are you? Do you think it's justified? Do you have a graphic? Okay, uh, do we see the duck curve? The, the duck curve. Uh, yeah, basically we should just, uh, you know, kill, kill the duck. <laughs> okay, look, um, the price, the tail is a high price, which is dropping, dropping at night and starts ra rising in the morning, then stagnates to zero during most of the uh, life part of the day. And then in the evening between seven and nine, once again, it just goes up. And uh, basically 150 uh, level per megawatt hour. Now I understand what you're talking about. I am uh, uh, concerned that the academicians are speaking in a more understandable way. Okay, look, the wind is blowing in the afternoon and in the evening. At the, this is the peak where, where is the peak consumption, one of the two peaks. In the Black Sea, it's not as strong wind as such as in the North Sea, but it uh, blows at a very convenient time for the Bulgarian electric energy system because it blows when the uh, you know the consumption is high. And the offshore wind will, for us, uh, solve. Uh, I mean the peak, uh, the peak issue basically. It will decrease the peak prices in the uh, later hours of the evening. I don't know to see if the second question is towards you or towards all the panelists, but you cannot build uh, uh, nuclear power without very high level of uh, fiscal deficit. So you're uh, assuming that other means of uh, state aid would be approved. Is it eligible at all? Is it admissible? Because I think there are a lot of procedures that we need to go through. Are we expecting state aid uh, being allowed in such colossal amounts? I do expect that it will be allowed, yes. The same way that uh, the th Turkey Stream and the uh, North Stream uh, were allowed, uh, even though they were contravening the requirements of the EU. And actually, there was a summit in Europe uh, dedicated towards lobbying in, in Europe. There was a France, which, of course, will always defend its interest, and it's part of the deal with Germany, in my opinion, is large-scale um, um, development of the energy market in Europe. I don't think the issue is a regulatory issue from the point of view of support, because there are some uh, a political uh, understanding that I believe this is not the correct way to go. But I think we should need to comply with our uh, legislation, and if we um, you know, if we follow our legislation, then it's obviously there is no way for us to give such a big, aid, such a huge aid to a private investor, what is essentially a private investor. Yes, uh, we are probably going to ask for uh, exceptions from the Bulgarian uh, competitive law. But the question is, are we all going to allow this to happen? Because our work and work of our colleagues is to prevent the Bulgarian law being, you know, broken because I think Europe is pretty clear what Europe is going to do. You know, Turkish, the Turkish stream and the North Stream. I'm sorry, Professor Kuschev, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that there is any NTP which is fully privatized, I mean, in which the state is not somewhat guaranteeing the risk or the waste management and so on. And thinking about this, do you think that Westinghouse would agree at all to participate in this project, uh, unless they've been given a guarantee that this uh, project will be funded with uh, state funds. Thank you, Martin. So perhaps we're going towards a change in the rules uh, based on a political and not on an economic decision. Okay, now let's see if we can uh, connect uh, Dr. Valentin Simeonov uh, on Zoom so that he can ask his question.
uh, greetings. Uh, thank you for uh, connecting me to this uh, uh, really interesting discussion. Of course, uh, the conclusion is correct. We should wait and uh, do a more uh, uh, precise analysis of the situation, but this analysis should also include the ever-changing and ever-shifting climate. Because I believe this is something that was not taken into consideration here, because I believe that there are no climate uh, deniers or climate skeptics among you. But as we saw this year, um, we started uh, passing through the 1.5 uh, degree increase threshold, which was expected to happen at the end of this decade or maybe 2026. And so far, there is no explanation as to why this is happening. There is already a concern that we may have gone through a tipping point, critical point. Uh, I believe that this could change radically because this will change the type of consumption of electric power from uh, winter to summer. Focal point because there will be more heat waves, longer. Very, very, very hot nights where the, the you know power provided by the renewable energy sources would not be able to cover the costs. And so in this context, nuclear power would be necessary. And I would like to actually amend uh, what some of the correct of some of the previous speakers saying that in Switzerland, indeed, one of the uh, nuclear power plants was uh, because it's indeed uh, obsolete and it's been uh, suspended. But there is a very uh, intensive rounds of discussion for the renewal of the existing power plants because under the uh, assumption that uh, we have the renewable energy, uh, the change, the climate change can we rely on the renewable energy sources. I'm going to quote the Anglo-Saxons. Do we need to put all of our eggs in the same basket? Because renewable energy sources are also vulnerable to climate change. And we saw this year in France, uh, there were several times hurricane winds, and this uh, will become more frequent. Why? Because the uh, ocean temperature is higher than ever, and it's the main driving force behind all of this. And we saw the Mediterranean wind. Uh, this is a threat to solar plants and to wind power. Uh, and we have uh, an increase in the uh, dimensions of uh, hailstorms, uh, of hail in hailstorms, which is also a threat to uh, photovoltaic power plants. And then there's also, there's a, let's say, uh, Krakatau or Tambora volcanic eruption in the 19th century, which could block completely uh, solar based energy. So, uh, nuclear power is very necessary. I'm not saying we should just uh, accept this project because this is not well thought out. But I have questions to Professor Kashir. Uh, Dr. Simeon, please be brief so that we have enough time to for an answer. Yeah. We are talking about nuclear te technology from the 50s and the 60s, <laughs> the 20th century. That's what we're working with. Why don't we work, at least in the European Union, maybe, uh, on the other technologies, such as, for example, the proliferation reactors, the uh, molten salts uh, reactors, which have a lot of advantages, and uh, those types of reactors um, are being operated in China and the United States, in the Philippines and Indonesia. We don't have a development in the European Union on those technologies. So the question is why? Okay, thank you for, for this opinion. I'm going to give the floor to our panelists, maybe the academicians who understand these uh, types of technologies. Yeah, Michael, the question is for the rapid reactors, the proliferation reactors. Okay, so this topic, um, it's, it's, it's been tabled since the you know middle of the 1950s. Uh, it's, uh, since the first reactor was uh, launched, the fact is that this reactor could theoretically produce more nuclear uh, fuel through incineration. And this way, uh, it can work for an extended period of time, basically endlessly. In, in this context, the development, uh, because it went through all of the stages and all of the countries started these um, programs uh, around 80 billion 
dollars were spent for scientific uh, research and development works. Those reactors were created, the uh, Super Phoenix and Phoenix uh, reactors in uh, Japan, Monju, and I don't know what else was the name, in Germany, in the States, in Russia, of course. However, experience has shown that the sodium-based uh, uh, reactors cannot deal with uh, the uh, fires caused by the interaction with the air and so on. And further, uh, they are economically not feasible based on the water code reactors. And so because of this, those programs were scrapped. The only country that's going down this road it has is Russia. They have two reactors operating. They have a 300 megawatt reactor complex that is being developed right now. And China is also building one, and uh, India is also building one. And I think that that's it. That's it. Um, more or less, uh, while the prices of uranium are below 300, 350 dollars per kilogram, this technology would not be feasible to develop. So if I may go back to the question that was asked, uh, what's going on in the region? What is being done in the region? Uh, the following countries from the south, Greece, Turkey, and so on, they have a huge explosion of development of renewable energy sources, as we all know. Uh, now, uh, the nuclear power plants, um, they cannot operate in uh, good interaction with the um, uh, renewable energy sources, such as, for example, the photovoltaic power plants and uh, the, you know, wind power plants, because they cannot follow their, uh, uh, you know, uh, cycle. Uh, but what do the neighboring countries do? Because they have a different philosophy. They are working with gas-powered uh, power plants. And Greece is thinking that all coal power plants will be shut down by 2028, and replaced by gas, natural gas powered power plants. Uh, they started uh, developing the baric gas power plants. Uh, these would be launched some in 2026, some in 2028. Uh, but in uh, 2026, so we are going to have around 2,600 megawatts for about 1.2 billion euro. And there's an interesting question here. When they say we're going to export uh, electric power to other uh, countries, uh, and Greece was even interested in seeing uh, how things are going to, how they can join with the seven or eight block. Uh, uh, last uh, year, when the prime minister was uh, making a groundbreaking of a, a 870 gas uh, a power plant near Alexandropolis, uh, he said. This power plant will not just uh, make our system resilient, but it will allow export of uh, electric power to Bulgaria. So they are thinking to build three state-of-the-art gas uh, power plants. And let me tell you, efficiency is 60, even to 63% that they are discussing. And the carbon emissions are around 3.5 or even 4 times lower than uh, lignite uh, coal power plants. What is Turkey doing? Uh, except for the NPP that they are building, they're also doing gas power plants around uh, 2018 megawatts. Um, I think they have around 40,000 megawatts in total. And if all, the, uh, all the power plants after 2010 are steam gas uh, power plants. Romania also has uh, a lot of uh, gas power plants. So I think it's time for us to, uh, I mean, start talking about it. And we're, we're talking about renewable energy sources because they're going to develop how are we going to balance or regulate the system. If we cannot do it with the nuclear power plants, if we do not build enough um, non, not batteries, but like, yeah, accumulators of uh, energy and so on, like, uh, for example, the pump activated uh, uh, power stations, uh, gravity-based power stations. Um, but I think, uh, I mean, the 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 the, the, the return is, uh, sorry, the power is. I mean, sixty euro per megawatt hour, uh, hours. Uh, it's a good, of course, taking into consideration the price of emissions. 
obviously martin you have a, a way to uh, you have a very short time to respond and uh, then uh, two more questions from the audience the reason for bulgaria to not have gas uh, by 2050 or to just uh, activate uh, varna hpp or, or uh, activate the cogeneration capacities by 2050 exactly because turkey and romania already have gas uh, capabilities and the system uh, from the point of view of uh, gas uh, uh, generation, is uh, well saturated. We don't need to. We don't need to fetish. It, uh, I mean, to to turn into a fetish the net export or the net surplus, and you know, it's not a it's not a, it's not a problem if you are a net exporter. But uh, let's say uh, being a net importer is not a problem if our uh, electricity would be more expensive uh, because investing in something that's probably not going to pay off in by 2035 or 2040 all of the gas generation power plants would have to shut down because there are rules for quotas and so on and the market of quotas is expected to rise and get 150 or 200 euro per ton and so even the gas power plants which are uh you know right now the hot thing uh they will lose uh, their uh, Attractiveness, but I do agree with you that we do need accumulating aggregate power plants. Oh, leave this thing aside. Come on, you don't know how things are going to develop by 2030. Please let's not get into a very long dialogue on this. We don't need to hypothesize very short statement by Professor Steele because we need to be able to ask the questions, uh, more questions. Uh, thank you. In relation to the question that you asked uh, through uh, Zoom. I personally do not know of a new nuclear project in Switzerland. Uh, furthermore, in relation to um, the uh, making sure that the system is backed up uh, uh, in case of, let's say, volcanoes, eruptions, and so on, I think the um, afternoon session, Professor Christo Vasilev with the backup uh, capabilities will uh develop the long term uh, backup would uh, develop and the prices for the backup are dropping and so i think also that there are always um some hesitation on the storage or accumulation and so on so the term that is consistent with the bulgarian meaning that we're using in bulgarian language is basically story because you Keep bad things. You store nuclear uh, waste. You store carbon or capture carbon dioxide. You capture them, you leave them somewhere, and you don't move them. You don't do anything with them. And something that you need to use and accumulate in times where it's abundant. And the uh, documents that it's uh, sh there is a shortage, and this is called in Bulgarian storage. The English term is absolutely correct. The uh, conservation term is, uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. That was a pretty clear uh, statement. Yeah, I mean, in Switzerland, sure, there might be discussion rounds going, but the long-term strategy uh, exit from the NPPs in 2045. So there might be a lot of discussions, but right now, Switzerland is going out of its nuclear power. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rivao Klebaro from the Environmental... Uh, Associations as a matter on uh, uh, questions related to the or matters related to the energy scenario that you presented. Uh, to what degree is this uh, taking into consideration the electrification of the residential or household sector and the need of uh, cooling? And how is this uh, uh, taking into consideration the load uh, bearing capacity of the distribution and the transmission uh, network? And what is the uh, attitude or uh, of this, uh, I mean, what is the let's say relevance of this potential to the uh, alternative uh, um, energy sources? The electrification of the household sector in Bulgaria is at very high levels compared to most of the European Union, where most uh, uh, homes are, I mean, they're using natural gas for cooking and for heating. And so in Bulgaria, the potential for additional um uh, electrification 
possibly backing up uh, is uh, basically using uh, firewood. And we're going to make an analysis on the sector of biomass for the illegal felling of forests uh, to use as uh, firewood. Uh, but the latest uh, analysis uh, basically says that the you know, use of firewood uh, for heating is, uh, has collapsed. It's just 26%. Uh, and the reason is that there is a very tragic reason for this uh, trend. And this is that many old uh, people have died in the provinces uh, because of the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, who have been predominantly the people who have used uh, wood for, for heating. This is, I mean, it's, it's a fact that you can clearly see in the statistics. And... Um, uh, the population of the villages and the small towns and the migration to the big towns means electrification as well as, you know, the urbanization during the Soviet period. And, uh, you know, decline in the use of firewood. Um, so, but why are we not seeing a steep climb of uh, the consumption of electric power? In our opinion, electrification is cancelling uh, or it's governed by some significant improvements in energy efficiency, which means so when we are moving people from the uh, provincial places um, uh, to you know cities and newer buildings with better improved energy classes and uh, energy efficiency in households, uh, all of these factors are basically creating a feeling to the potential limitation of uh, the consumption because there is a lot of potential in decreasing intensity. And so I'm of the opinion that we should not speculate with the 100% electrification of households and buildings where uh, the matter stands what's going to happen with transportation, for example. Uh, our transportation policy is free for all, which means Anyone can buy as many cars as they want. The tax incentives are backwards, so they're stimulating buying older cars, legacy cars, which pollute more. Uh, you build uh, uh, highways instead of building railroads, so you expand roads instead of managing traffic more effectively, and so on and so on. So all of these policies are actually resulting in the fact that people have interest in buying more cars. And we are of the opinion that because at the right this time people are not able to uh, buy electric vehicles, EVs, they will lock down, as well as we're going to lock down with the a, with a nuclear power plant, they're going to uh, be locked with the internal combustion engine cars. And because we have this uh, very slow uh, period of uh, turnover of uh, cars, we're going to see the transport uh, electrification very slowly. If we see anything like this, it would have an S-curve after 2035. That's my opinion, at least. Thank you, Martin. And uh, during your presentation, it was already stated that Bulgaria is a quite electrified uh, country already. The uh, results of the study have not been published uh, yet, but in Bulgaria, it uh, shows that a lot of the heating is um, done, but in a... I mean, uh, an oil radiator compared to an AC has several times of difference uh, in uh, terms of uh, um, of difference in uh, effectiveness. So, very short uh, uh, words just to wrap up. Uh, thank you. I have a lot of questions, but I think we can continue discussing informally during the break. I hope that the panelists will remain for the second panel, uh, but I personally am just very, very brief comment. Sorry. Yeah. Professor Simeonov said, um, uh, Dr. Simeonov said, sorry, uh, climate change has an impact, uh, but they impact uh, air flows uh, and also water flows. Uh, and, uh, precipitation in Bulgaria has declined, so, I mean, the Danube is... Uh, drying out and it's possible that the uh, NPP because can be without cooling water. It's a very serious issue. Nobody is discussing it. And so these hailstorms and these storms and the climate change, they are caused by increasing not just carbon dioxide, but also methane. 
28 times more expensive, uh, more sorry, more powerful greenhouse gas, TH4. And this is uh, one of the main catalysts of, considered to be one of the main catalysts of forget about the gas. The transition fuel is four years ago already. And I'm going to talk about a new solution, geothermal energy, because geothermal energy is not susceptible to the energy specific of the atmosphere. And I hope that you, I do hope that you remain until the end. My question was to Martinos, why was it not in the scenario? Because I know it's, a, it's part of the projections. Thank you. Uh, I can I can respond. Uh, the response is that the geothermal energy in Bulgaria is, um, uh, can be done under such high costs uh, that um, optimizing the expenses of the computer calculated and so on said basically that we're basically it's not feasible. If I may quote a film, computer says no. Um, uh, it's much more expensive than offshore wind. Uh, okay, thank you both of you, uh, but let's not go uh, difficult debate. No, I am I, I am for geothermal, but the model says no, it's very expensive. Uh, please wrap up words from all panelists. We're going to be behind the lunch uh, schedule. So if within a minute, please, all of you, just within a minute, just wrap up um, a final you know, a uh, statement for this panel, where are we going from here? Where to from here? Um, I am talking in a different aspect. My, my short statement to all of you is, or message to all of you is, what we do in Europe and in, in North America and in other parts of the world, we've all been orienting about the, the same way of self-governance. Uh, we discuss, analyze, we take government and solutions after a wide public discussion, analysis in the conditions of democracy and following the basic fundamental rules. There are a few exceptions from this rule, such as Russia, China, and Iran. But even countries such as India are striving towards us. And so I think that we need to a return to our right, the democracy, the democratic way of making these decisions in the area of nuclear energy, because as I said in the very beginning, I believe this was a part of the legacy that we started the transition from totalitarian government to democracy. And I hoped that we have concluded with this <laughs> era of uh, totalitarian government. I am very impressed with what the attorney at law um, Shumov said. I would like to also um, have this uh, legacy of the beginning of the transition uh, be preserved, not the one that currently exists, which is a mutilated version of itself. But um, I uh, think that if we have a state central government plan of development, transparent, organized, these um, discussions, such as our discussion right now, uh, complaining that decisions are being made that are not justified, that are anti-state, that are harmful, not just towards us, but as if they're harmful for our uh, surrounding, uh, it will not work. And I really apologize to Mr. Vladimirov for saying that we don't have an organization that does energy planning. They do energy planning. So, but this is not a state organized, responsible, par impartial, not biased, uh, independent planning. So, thank you for, for the Bulgarian state to grow and develop and then Bulgarian energy in particular, and the Bulgarian economy as a result, we need to have strategic planning of these processes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. If we go back to the... Yeah, please, please speak closer to the mic. Okay, going back to the previous issue. Uh, issue. Do you need Unit 7 and eight, 8 at this stage? My absolute response is no, we don't. And this project is up 
absolutely not necessary. It looks to me as something that has a huge potential for corruption. 3.5 or 4 billion disappeared from Berlin. And there's another corruption scheme that is being uh, created right now um, as we speak. I hope that this doesn't happen due to many different uh, possibilities. Uh, court uh, repeating the decision. European Commission also uh, taking a negative stance on it would also be good. And um, I think we are going to go to the point in time where we're not going to be able to find funding for uh, implementation of this project. And I hope, and I also share this opinion, that if this project were to be implemented, this most likely will mean um, preliminary uh, shutdown of uh, units five and six, as was uh, units three and four of uh, NPP, because will be forced upon us back in the day and there would be a campaign let's close the bad uh, old uh, russian reactors so that the good new uh, american reactors can work with a very expensive um, nuclear uh, power that they generate and the future which we are going to be very very uncertain on how we're going to deal with all of these issues okay i am going to wrap up with a funny note uh, Lenin has said, communism is Soviet power and electrification. I'm going to say that perhaps these are the uh, main reasons for the construction of uh, Unit 7 and 8. Uh, repeating the models for state planning, which is based on uh, political interference and in the expert level debate and the expert level decisions. And so let's swap the Soviet uh, power and uh, uh, electrification with democratized, decentralized process. Because in Bulgaria, Soviet power is directly related to the private interests of some uh, oligarchy networks, which one of them goes directly to the communist rule 30 years ago. Thank you, Martin. Thank you to all panelists. Thank you to the organizers, because I believe this was a very timely, a very necessary debate. We can absolutely talk a lot more about this topic, but I think this is the time that we had allotted for today. To all of us who are following us online, please uh, welcome to the second part uh, that has been organized today. Uh, it will start exactly 1.30 Eastern European time or 12.30 Central European time. Uh, under the uh, guys' uh, opportunities and obstacles to the green transition where the moderator will be Todor Todorov uh, uh, from Zazimiata. All of you who are in the room, uh, welcome uh, in the lobby. We've organized a short lunch and let's uh, talk about everything that was uh, previously unsettling.